This morning, uh, I want us to focus on the cross. Uh, the word of the cross is power. In Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, in the first chapter, the 18th verse, he says, The word of God is folly to those who are dying. But to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God. I want us to focus on the cross, and particularly when you add cross to any other word, it gives it strength and meaning. So today I want to begin by cross examination, to examine as Jesus did in the garden, what am I supposed to do? Next Sunday on Palm Sunday, we'll look at a cross section of the people that were there. And believe me, in that crowd of folks with Jesus going up the hill into the city, there was a mixture of all kinds of people. On Monday, Thursday, we will look at a cross purpose. Jesus had a purpose when he went to the cross. But I have to say, sometimes we're at cross purposes with Jesus because we don't want it to happen that way, and we want what we want. On Easter, we'll look at the cross marks. Jesus had the marks of the cross in his hands and his feet, for they nailed him to it. And like Thomas, many of us say, well, unless I can see the marks in his hands and his feet, I will not believe. So, beloved, on Easter, I want you to believe that Jesus is raised from the dead. So today I want us to begin by cross-examining. Jesus went to the garden to pray, to make sure that what he was about to do is exactly what God wanted. He's on the right track. I love Lent. It's a good time for us to ask ourselves, am I on the right track? Am I doing what God wants me to do with my life? To make sure... We examine and cross-examine what we do. A group of refugees from China came to America. Now, we've got a lot of refugees coming to America. Not many of them come from China. But there was a group who came from China to America, and they went to a church nearby where they were staying. One day, one of the people in the church had the audacity to ask them, why are you coming to church? You're from China. You don't necessarily believe in Jesus Christ as the Lord. And one of them said, we're coming to church because in the refugee camp, we were told you can trust the people of the cross. You can trust the people of the cross. Can they trust us as United Methodists to be open and willing to accept everybody in from every background and every country and every place? Could we stand the test of being cross-examined? Would there really be enough evidence to convict us? I hope so. This morning I want to say three things about this passage of Scripture. First, Jesus went to the garden to pray. It was a habit. How many of you have habits? We all have some habits. Jesus went, it was his habit to pull away from the crowd, to spend some time in prayer with the Father. Perhaps he's trying to teach us that it's a good time to pray. He went there in the evening. He went to the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, Ann and I have had the privilege of being to the Holy Land three different times, taking groups there. And the the Garden of Gethsemane is on, I guess, is this the east side? It's on the east side of the valley. It's the Kidron Valley that goes down. Uh, just about a mile and a half past Gethsemane is Bethany, the town that Jesus spent most of his nights in when he was there in that last day. The Garden of Gethsemane sits up on the hill. It's about a half a mile as you come down the hill and go around the long road and up into the city of Jerusalem. In the Garden of Gethsemane, there are two trees. They're olive trees. They still produce olives, and they're estimated by the people to be over 3,000 years old. 
Now, when we went the first time, we climbed up in it. You can't get very close to it now. They found out people were breaking branches and, and abusing it. But think that Jesus was in that garden that night, and perhaps he was praying underneath one of those beautiful olive trees that were there. Was his habit to pray? Was his habit to go to the Garden of Gethsemane? Habits can be helpful and useful and powerful. If you don't create a good habit, you'll end up with some bad ones. And sometimes our bad habits are more important to us than the good habits. Mike Campbell uh, writes a little story in which he said, uh, I came home from work one night and my wife was in with our six-month-old teaching him to say da-da. Man, he said, first word he's going to learn is da-da, daddy. I am so excited. Several weeks later, in the middle of the night, they were awakened with the voice of a small child saying da-da, da-da. And he said, my wife rolled over and said, honey, he's calling you. Habits are learned. He's calling us. Perhaps Jesus is calling us to pray, to spend some time in our day, to pull away from the busyness, and to be with God. I have a question for you. How much does a prayer weigh? If you were weighing a prayer, how much would it weigh? A woman came into a grocer near the end of the war, in World War II, and she said to the grocer, uh, I need some food. Can you please help us? My husband was killed in action, and I have nothing for my little children. Well, the grocer was a pretty mean son of a gun. And he said to her, all right, if that's what you want. And he handed her a piece of paper, and he said, write your prayer on this piece of paper. She said, I don't need to, and handed him a crumpled piece of paper. And he put it on the scale. And he said, I'm going to put on this side of the scale all the food that that prayer weighs. So he said, I put an, a, a potato on it. Didn't move. I began to pile some other things into it. Still, it didn't move. Finally, he said it got so full, it was overflowing. I got a bag, I gave it to her, I sent her on her way because I had noticed people were watching to see what I was going to do. He said, as I closed up that night, I checked and the scale had broken. <laughs> now, he said to himself, I wonder why, as he cross-examined the day, why the scale broke at that particular time. And it touched his life and changed him greatly. And he said, over the years, many people came in hungry. And the scale broke every time. Because he had been changed from the habit of greed and anger and selfishness to generosity. Jesus is calling us. God is calling us to a spirit of that kind of generosity. So I say to you today, Jesus came to the garden to pray. Left the disciples, took James and John and Peter, went a little further, left them there and went on into the garden to pray. He fell down, he prayed to God uh, very deeply. He prayed, you know, the scripture says, I love Luke's account, he says he prayed, it was agony in the garden. He was agonizing over what was facing him. Uh, he prayed, oh, Lord, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to do this. How human that is. How many times have we said to God, I don't want to do that. I remember as a young person, God called me to ministry and I ran. I didn't want to do it. And finally, I answered the call. God doesn't quit. But there's some degree of agony. Uh, let the cup pass from me. Let somebody else do it. 
A lot of scholars say he was crying and, and agonizing over the fact that he had to die, that he was going to die on the cross. And the next day was coming, and he did not want to die. I've been in the hospital with many people, and they pray. I don't think we pray. I don't think Jesus prayed not to die. I think he prayed, I want to go on living. I want to have more time to do what needs to be done. I can see Jesus saying, Father, I've got more sermons to preach, more people to heal, more things to do. I want more time. Just a little more time to do what needs to be done. I want to tell you something. We don't have a right to life. We don't have a right to so many days of life. Anybody can take a life. Only God can give it. And every child I ever had was a wonderful gift from God. Jesus wanted to live he wanted more time. And then the second thing I want to say is he came and he found them sound asleep. He got a little angry with them. I'm sure he kicked them. That's what I would have done. Wake them up. Get them going again. And then he went away a second time to pray. He prayed, oh, Lord, if this cup is not going away, if I can't change it at all, then not my will but yours be done. We like our own personal will. We like to do it our way. Henry David Thoreau wrote a book. It was entitled, A Week on the Concord and Mary Mack Rivers. Now, doesn't that sound exciting? A Week on the Concord and Mary Mack Rivers. The publisher who published the book published a thousand copies. After several months, he came to Henry David Thoreau and he said, the books aren't selling very well at all. And he said, so I want you to buy them all back. Some 706 of them, he said. So he said, I bought the books back. I brought them home. I put them in my library. A few days later, he wrote in his personal journal, I have almost 900 books in my library. And 700 of them were written by me. We like what we do, what we write, what we say. We want our way. We treasure the self. But it is giving up to God that is the most important. Oh, if I could just spend more time with my family, my friends. If I could just make, do something significant. If I could get on television or be famous or, you know, I need more time to do all that. It's not death that we fear. We want to cling to life. Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. He came a second time, and of course the disciples were sound asleep again. Now this time I don't think he kicked them. He shook them pretty good. Can you not stay awake with me one hour at a time? It is so, so frustrating and agonizing. And he went away a third time. And the third time he went away, it says that he pretty much said the same thing he had said before. I like to expand on that and say he had just spoken so much he didn't have anything else to say. I'm sure you've never run out of things to say. But it was time to listen. He said, it not my will, but thine be done. And I think in that third conversation, he had the time to stop and ask God to speak to him. And God spoke to him. And he knew when he left that place what he was to do. God had given him his direction, his marching orders. Lyndon Baines Johnson once wrote to a good friend of his, and he said, I have two basic rules for how to get along with your wife. He said, number one, 
let her think she's actually getting her way. And he said the second one is, let her have her way. That's what Jesus did when he came the third time out of the garden. Let God have his way. Not like Frank Sinatra who sang, I did it my way, but singing, I'll do it your way, God. God is giving us a direction. I close with a little story. It's the story about a man who, or a young man who was in college. He was taking his final exam. It was actually the final exam of his whole four years. He was taking a logic course. And the professor was famous for giving very, very, very hard tests. So the professor said to him and to them, since I give hard tests, I'll give you a choice. You can bring an eight and a half by 11 and a half sheet of paper and on it you can write all of the answers you want. Well, you know, most people, they begin to write. Some would write so small you could hardly see it so they could get all the facts and all the things that people had said about logic on that piece of paper. When they asked one student, what have you written on your paper? He said, I didn't write anything. I just drew a drawing. What? They said, you didn't write anything? He said, no, I just made a drawing. So on the day of the test, they all came in. They had their eight and a half and by 11 and a half sheets. They had all their answers that people had given them and written down on that piece of paper. And then this young man who was bringing a drawing came in. He walked to his desk and he laid the drawing on the floor. It was a cross, or more efficiently, it was an X. And into the class came a senior who had graduated and gone on to graduate school in philosophy and logic who had made an A on the test the year before. And he came in as he laid it on the floor, and he stood on that X. And the young man said, I'm ready now to take the test. <laughs> Whatever the questions, I know he will have the answers. He was ready to be cross-examined by the professor. Which would you rather have? Some answers that somebody wrote on a piece of paper or somebody said to you, this is the thing to believe about life, about God, about what goes on. Do you want to read what other people say? Or had you rather have somebody standing on the cross with the marks in his hand who've been here, gone there, and come back here to remind us that there's a place for all of us there? Had you rather have a real live human being who aced the test of life or depend on someone else for your answers? Jesus trusted the Father. I trust Jesus, and I hope you will too. Let us pray. Lord, I give thanks to you for the message that you give to us in Scripture of Jesus who gives us the path that leads the way to life, to death, and to life beyond death. Fill us that we may more often come to you regularly, build a habit of prayer, and follow you and do what you want us to do. In Jesus' name, amen.